Welcome to today's show, Toronto. I'm your host, Jay Stoy, and you're in for a special presentation. What we're doing here today is we're interviewing all of Toronto mayoral candidates, and today we have Sarah Kleiman. Hey, Sarah, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Wow, this is very exciting. We were talking off camera, and Sarah was sharing some really good information on what it takes to, I guess, become the mayor or even to get into the, the race. So yes. tell our viewers, because I know a lot of our viewers are really hungry for just meat and potatoes information on the election. They don't need to get all into detail. So what you said was gold. So tell our viewers what it takes to get into the race. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people uh, ask about mayoral qualifications. You know, do you need to be a leader of a business or a political party or these kinds of things? But actually, all you need to run for mayor is 25 signatures and you need uh, $200, which is refundable as long as you submit your campaign pa paperwork and you need to be a qualified voter. So really any one of us could run for mayor if we can gather 25 people to support our nomination. That's so, I mean, that's called democracy. Yes. <laughs> but that's a little watered down, like 25 votes. I mean, you could get 25 cousins. Right. I mean, I, and we were talking, maybe it should be raised, the number should be raised a little just because it really filters through the people who are serious and maybe the people who are just doing it for their own intentions. Yeah. yeah. Right? So yeah. that's it. I really thank you for sharing that with her. That's really interesting. So why don't we do this? Why don't we just start off the top and tell us three of your strongest policies that you're passionate about? Um, well, I'm really passionate about revisiting our streets. Right now, our streets are primarily corridors for cars. At least that's how we treat them with our business and our zoning regulations and our transportation funding even. But our streets are so much more than that. They're places for local businesses. They're places for people in the neighborhood to come and be with their neighbors. And um, people get around by more ways than just cars. They get around by transit, they get around by walking, being in a wheelchair, being on a bicycle. So I think really treating our, tr our streets as magnificent resources of opportunity is what I'd like to do, rather than just being congested, traffic-clogged areas. And where would you put the bike lanes? Because you hear a lot of like anger from drivers right. over bike lanes, but bikers are needed. Like right. they need it. They need. They deserve a spot on the street. Right. But it just seems like they're always at each other. So where would you come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to take a wider view so that we don't see each other as drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, wheelchair users. Like all of us are going to be in one mode or another at different times in our lives. So I think that the discussion only about bike lanes is too restrictive. I think it's how do we move the most number of people the most safely in a way that creates a good city. And so for some streets, you might want a bicycle corridor. That might be the right thing. For other streets, you might want to just have lanes that can accommodate everything because the traffic is slow enough that no one's at risk from each other. You know, if you've got a car going 60 kilometers, everybody else is at risk who's not in a car. So a street with that kind of infrastructure needs to have good, safe pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. But a street with lots of local businesses where you have just slower moving traffic anyways because of the nature of the street, do you need a bike lane there or do you just need a street that's got a really wide sidewalk, that's got slower traffic so bikes and cars can be in the same space? I think sometimes business areas and neighborhoods and people can get together and say what works better here. So it's not just bike lane versus car. I wonder because you know we are one of the major cities in North America. Obviously we're not the size of Chicago or New York. So do our mayor candidates or our mayor right now, Jennifer or before John, do you think they look at cities like New York City and go, how do you deal with the congestion downtown? Like, because they deal with it. What is it? Why, why can New York City do it? And Toronto, half the size or a quarter of the size has just as many problems as New York City or less. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we do look at other cities. I'm not sure why, you know, it takes political will to make any change. So I think you can see with a lot of things in Toronto, whatever happened 20 years ago is kind of what we're still doing. We just, it's hard, it's one thing to look at another city like Amsterdam would be a great city. I mean, congestion's actually worse there. They have bike lanes everywhere or bicycle infrastructure everywhere, but there's a totally different mindset around traffic. So you can't just sort of adopt what another city is doing without looking at the mindset, the political will, the way of taking action here. So I think that's one of the problems with comparing Toronto to another city is 
You can only do what another city does if you're willing to live and see things the way the other city sees them. And you had two other issues or a couple issues that you wanted to well, talk about? Well, I mean, environment is a big, big yep. issue for me because I just, we talk about environment as if it's like, you know, some butterflies or some kind of frill that, you know, isn't business. And environment is our life support systems. Environment, environment is the water we drink, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the wildlife we depend on, the, the trees that give us shade. And I think we still have this old mindset where environment is over here and everything else is here. And I think we need to integrate the environment into everything. And we need to take it out of this left-right divide. Again, it seems to have um, arisen when people on the right, they want clean air and water just as much as people on the left. So if we have solutions that are dividing people along partisan lines, maybe we need to have new solutions. But the goal still needs to be you know, clean air and water. I seen this article, I think it was probably on Twitter. Like, I like Twitter because Twitter is, you know, it gives you updates. I mean, it's got a lot of garbage on it, obviously. But if you're looking for news and real fast updates, it's there. It's on Twitter, right? right. So I was watching this article, just what you're talking about, how this scientist, I guess it was a, it was a science show, yeah. right? So the host had on uh, a scientist. And he says, well, and she's talking about emissions and talking about climate change and talking about this and all that. And he says, well, I don't know if you're aware, but we've been doing, not me, but the whatever, the, the globe, we've been doing data research over the last four decades on emissions. And he goes, emissions rose this much. He goes, you know how much the earth uh, rose? Like this much, like nothing. Mm -hmm. So for four decades, we've been testing the emissions in the earth to see if the, we're causing it to get hotter. Right. And I'm not talking scientific right. talk here, right. but his end result was no, it's not. And she's going, you got proof. I said, yeah, she goes, he goes, you got the proof. I gave right. it to you. Right. Well, this is the thing so, I think when you're debating like big issues like climate change yeah. or whatever, you get into those kinds of arguments. Whereas I think we need to just talk to people about, do you want to park in your neighborhood? Do you want the air to be clean in your neighborhood? Do you want to be able to swim in the lake and drink the water? And those mean something. Then you're not arguing Absolutely. over like statistics or degrees of warming or cooling or all that stuff, which is far from most of our lives. We need to just talk about what's right in front of us. And there's so many environmental issues right in front of us that we actually could do something about. I agree. I agree. And the last one now, the, the other... Uh, uh, and, well, just, I mean, housing, housing, obviously, right? Because quality of life in the city is, is housing and transportation and environment. Everything else, poverty, crime, inequity, a lot of that arises from those three issues. So let me ask you this. So those three issues, let's say transportation. Yep. Okay, transportation, environmental, and the and, and housing. And housing. So if someone said to you, put forward one point, point, point. I, I don't want to put you on the spot or nothing, but sure. I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Right? So if someone said, give us your number one policy when it comes to housing that will combat what's going on right now, what would you say? Uh, I would say eliminate all the zoning except for the very most important thing. So right now, if you want to go and put an extra apartment in your house for mm -hmm. you know, a relative or a student or whatever it is, you have to go through quite a lot of city permitting and bylaws. It's really hard for you. I mean, I'm an English speaking, edu university educated person. I got my bylaw information if I wanted to turn my garage into a laneway, which is supposedly easy right now. It's still not no. easy. And I, I can barely understand the, in the instructions and the processes, and it's very lengthy and costly. So the city, rather than saying, what are you going to do, government? What are you going to do? It's like, what are, how about not doing the things that stop housing? But you wouldn't be able to, you could just make that recommendation to the interior government, right? Like if well, you Well, no, because the city has a lot of, by the city has 200,000 bylaws. Those are city bylaws. So you could do that. You so could we, do some of them. Yeah, not me alone, but with our departments, we could say, you know what, let's, let's take a different look at planning where we don't tell people what to do. We let them do things and we have still a few basic standards. You know, you don't want a 50 story apartment building put yep. it willy nilly everywhere. You don't want to build on ravines. You don't want to put a nuclear power plant in your backyard. But other than those big things, we don't need to micromanage. Do everything. away with regulations. Do away with every regulation right? that's regulations. not necessary or not enforceable. So let's flip the subject now. And I know we were talking off camera about the TTC. So right. obviously there's, you know, it's in the paper every day, people, innocent people are getting injured, injured, injured. So how do we combat that? Yeah, well, um, crime is one of those things that's, again, it's kind of, it comes out of our environment. So we can't really combat crime on our, on our own. We have to look at our, our environment and our economic health and our s social health. So TTC is where we have a lot of people. You get, um, you know, I don't know, it's like hundreds of millions of trips every year. Of course, you're going to have incidents happen. So, I mean, part of what we need to 
keep in mind is the media kind of gets excited about things sometimes and then that's all you hear about. So they'll stop talking about the TTC soon. The crime will still be there. They'll just be moved on moved to something, on something else, else, right? So uh, we don't need to kind of get hysterical about these things, but we do need to say, okay, well, what, you know, again, what reduces crime? Having environments where people feel welcome, having environments where there are lots of people, you know, the more deserted things are, the more likely you can have something, you know, bad happen. Well, because if you find out on the, like, Crime is either done by reoccurring felons who are not afraid of the penalty, mm -hmm. right? People who have mental health issues, right? right? Or just bad people in general, right? Uh -huh. But I think we, for housing for the mental health, like I don't understand why the government or whoever makes these decisions, first of all, they don't take care of our, our mental health people. Right. But if they decide to do it, they do it right in the city. Why do they have to do it in the city? Why can't they go out to outskirts of Barrie, nice sprawling property, lots of green? Do it there. They're mentally ill. They're going to be taken care of. They don't need to be in downtown Toronto going out and getting caught like Cam H all the time. Mm. They don't need that. I just don't understand why they... Why yeah. they wouldn't do that? I think there's a lot of, I'm sure, provincial issues around healthcare and what's the best place to have people. And those would be, you know, things you need to figure out by looking at the actual populations who are using these institutions. But one thing when it, just coming back to crime on the TDC as it yep. relates to mental health, again, the number of incidents that happen that are really serious. Really the ones serious. You don't want, it's, it's very few. So what we need to do is make the system Again, clean, friendly, accessible, affordable, frequent, reliable, so you have a healthy system. And then when you do have those very few incidents come up, you can deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis, rather than kind of come up with one solution that's gonna eliminate crime. Like, probably we're not gonna eliminate crime, we're not gonna eliminate mental health, but we can make our system better and then deal case-by-case -case for each individual situation. Yeah, I think has, something has to be done with the reoccurring felons. Like, I just don't, I just don't get why, especially for a violent crime. If you commit a violent crime against an innocent person, you should lose any, anything that is going your way. Like, no, you hurt a violent, you hurt an innocent person. Now, if you're sick, well, that's, that's the problem of the system. It doesn't mean it's okay. It can't happen again, but it happens again and again and again. So we, ha we have to really look, especially for our community. Right. So I have a lot of people who are, obviously they're all disabled, but a lot of them are also in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. They are so vulnerable in a wheelchair. It, it's, and they got to take the transit. Right. right. I mean, a lot of them take wheels transit, yeah. but some of them just hop on the subway or whatever. Yeah. They're going down the street and, you know, and they tell us all the time. It's mm -hmm. very, and even with ladies, like I, I've even talk to a lot of just, you know, ladies, yeah. and they're scared. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the thing of when you talk, mentioned the word vulnerable, I think that is something we can do to make our society so that people are less vulnerable and less isolated. And so that comes back to the environment itself, like having a transit system that is fully accessible, that has enough people who are on hand to witness or step in. You know, most people are friendly, do want to help, are able to help. And so if you have a system that's treated well, you're gonna have lots of those people there, so no one is isolated. Someone's there to give you a hand. If you have a system that's treated badly, that's decrepit, that's um, deserted, then, you, then only the people who have to use transit are gonna be the ones on there, and they're gonna be isolated and vulnerable. So what we can do as a society is make people less vulnerable and less isolated, and that will help with dealing with you know, instances that happen. We're here with Sarah Kleimenhag. She is running for the Toronto mayor for what? Uh, June 23rd is the June big day. June 26th. Now yeah. I understand there's uh, 65 something like that candidates in that are running. That's a lot. So let me ask you a couple more questions because we're just running short on time here. Now, as far as uh, accessibility, are you familiar a lot with accessibility and uh, the housing and just in general? What is your, your view, your point of view, your plan for accessibility to grow it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar with a lot of the very detailed specifics that affect the communities that are affected by the lack of accessibility in Toronto, but I am familiar with the inaccessibility on the, the narrowness of our sidewalks that you can't go down with a wheelchair or even a stroller sometimes. I'm, I'm familiar with the inaccessibility of some of our um, you know, of housing, of the difficulty it is to get housing. So, I mean, my, my plan would again to be like, let's look at what the barriers are to getting better accessibility. Let's look at, you know, w how can we make our sidewalks 
wider? Where can we make space for people of all abilities? Um, that's in the sort of freedom of moment, movement area. And where can we make sure our public spaces, we have enough of them? You know, we have enough, pub we need to have enough public libraries, we need to have enough public spaces. I know I was talking to someone um, who's in a wheelchair who's very dependent on, on the Wi-Fi that he gets from mm -hmm. the library because it's a, it's a significant expense, isn't yep. it? And he was just saying how there's too few places in the city where they can get good Wi-Fi or where the, even to access it from their home. So there's, there's accessibility is a broad spectrum of what the city needs to do. And I think always number one with any of these issues is to talk directly with the people who are affected. So rather than someone in City Hall making decisions on what we should do for accessibility, kind of have a forum at the Disability Channel. I like that um, idea. I like, because that's what we do, right? That's, yeah. what, that's what our programs are all about accessibility. So we have a lot of great graduates and great participants who know the world of accessibility. Right. So let me ask you a couple more questions. Let me ask you this one. What inspired you to run? Well, this is my third time running, actually. Okay. I ran in 2018 and 2022, and then now. And originally, I was inspired just because I think municipal politics is so much more exciting than we think it is, because it affects everything. It affects this building. It affects the park outside. It affects the library down the street. It affects the traffic lights. Our lives are municipal politics. And so I was inspired to run for mayor, because I think the mayor, with a great vision, can really transform a city, can really be making a city, you know, according to their vision, really. And I haven't really necessarily um, appreciated the vision of, of, of previous mayors, or at least the, the way I've seen it translated. So I was inspired to run because I knew it was possible. I knew I had a vision. I knew it, it meant something to me, these policies that, that govern our lives. And uh, so each time it's been different. The first time it was primarily uh, street safety and environment. The second time I was also interested in kind of personal freedom came into it for okay. me. Okay, there's been a lot of discussion over the past three years about that. Um, and then this time it's, it's, you know, not that much has changed in the last eight months, but uh, this commitment to kind of a different style of government, like decentralized, less regulations mm -hmm. like I talked about, but still commitment to the important things in life, important public spaces, clean air, clean water. So I think that there could be an interesting new way, approach to government that's not about left and right, that's about everyone working together. That's great, Sarah. I'll ask you one more question. This might be the most important question. Your feeling of our beloved uh, Gordon Lightfoot passing away. Oh, well, I mean, it's any time a Canadian public figure, especially a musical figure who's, you know, meant a lot to people's hearts, it yeah. takes a big, it has a big impact. And I think what it shows, I love that so many people care and that so many people are, have this relationship to music and our musical figures and Gordon Lightfoot in particular. I think music is, is part of life, one of the best parts of life. Right, Canadian legend. He, yeah. When you think of Canadian musicians, uh, he's always at the top. Yeah. Him him for the for me, him for the male side and Anne Murray right. for the female side. It's just their yeah. Canadian icon. So before I let you go, if people want to find out more information about you, Sarah, where could they go? Yeah, the easiest way is just votesarah.ca. It's pretty easy to remember, or you can Google Sarah for Toronto Mayor. I think I'm the only Sarah so far running. So I think so. Yeah. I think you're right. That's yeah. great, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Very nice Much to appreciated. Talk to you. Again, you're watching the Toronto Today Show. I'm Jay Stoy, and we'll see you next time. All about inclusion and really giving everyone a fair say. Welcome to the Today Show. This is our flagship show. I am Unstoppable Tracy. I am Zach Damon. It is a pleasure to be here. I am excited. What is up? We have a great show today. Jay Stoyan here for the Disability Channel, the world's only inclusive channel for and by persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, everyone. We have people watching from all over the world, but also all over Ontario. We also take a concerted attention in the veterans community. In moments of stress and trauma, we can get a hold of ourselves. To help make a difference for people with disabilities, to show people how to love themselves or their disability. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys having me, giving this platform for myself and other people with disabilities. Thank you so much, folks, for joining us for this episode of the Disability Channel of Detroit. Please tune in next time.
Welcome back. Wow, what a day today. We are having the mayor candidates of Toronto into the studio, finding out about their vision, their, their plan, what they have to do with accessibility, how they're going to take care of persons with disabilities and veterans in Toronto in general. So we really want to thank this opportunity because bringing on some high profile individuals, you know, who are getting the camera light, the spotlight in Toronto, it shines a spotlight on what we do. And what we do is provide opportunities. We provide opportunities to persons with disabilities and veterans through our employment programs, which are endorsed and financed through the Ontario government. So this is a great opportunity for our uh, participants in our class, which are actually here today. So they're getting a hands-on feel of production, live television, and they're also learning the skill just like so they can replace or also move into position where our former graduates have. So they work for us or we outsource them to great companies that they work with. So it's wonderful. So I really want to thank uh, everybody for participating today. It was a wonderful day. We'll see who's going to become mayor of Toronto. You never know. They did have some good policies, you know, some good ideas, some good plans, good vision. So I think there's a lot of candidates out there. So we're still looking to connect with a few. If you want to come on our platform, showcase your plans, your policies, your views to our community, check us out, www.thedisabilitychannel.ca, or you can email personally me, myself, j at thedisabilitychannel.ca. We would love to have you right here beside you. Come on in. Let's have a casual conversation. Let's see what your policies are for Toronto. Again, you're watching the Toronto Show Today's show, Toronto Show. I'm Jay Stoy. We'll see you next time.